The 2022 Ford Ranger has dropped its heavy camo ahead of its official reveal in just a few weeks and its Australian launch next year. Yes, it's time to strap in for another edition of the Cars Guide podcast, the show that takes you beyond the test drive. This is episode 203, 2022 Ranger, ready to tackle Hilux. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and joining me in taking our best look yet at the soon-to-arrive T6.2 Ranger is Cars Guide Adventure Editor Crafty. Morning. And esteemed contributor Steve. Esteemed. Hello. <laughs> we'll, we'll, Steve. Also, we'll also look at the fresh metal we've been driving this week and dive into your feedback. YouTubers, if you want to plot your own adventure, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below. And you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's hit the start button. And listen, we've we've just run a story yesterday. Um, Justin Hilliard, uh, our deputy news editor, was the author. Um, we've got the new Ranger coming after a 10-year run for the current car, which, which is typically in the fight as the best-selling individual model uh, month to month in the country. Um, it's been designed and engineered in Australia. Um, and it's we've seen now lightly or less camouflaged images of this car. In fact, if you're around the place, you, you're possibly able to see these still in their final stages of pre-production testing. Um, and we want to talk through the details. It's, it's obviously going to be um, a straight up fist fight with the Hilux, which has been such a favourite for so long in Australia. And, and even it was, was launched in its current form in 2015. It's getting on with some updates in 2020, your Rogue and your, your Rugged X and, and so on. But uh, we've got this new Ranger. And I suppose the, the, the question, first of all, I might start with you, Crafty. Um, what do you reckon a Ranger has to do to really finally get on top of Hilux and, and shake, shake it off and, and stand out on its own at, at the head of the pack when it comes to, to dual cab use? Well, we've seen um, this month, I think VFAX figures were released the other day. And uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, but Ranger Hilux did slip a touch this month. Yep. Yeah, uh, than the latest figures. Um, it's always been a bit of a, you know, like the range has been narrowing that gap uh, quite successfully, mm. uh, but not always, um, you know, beating the Hilux in terms of sales. Uh, it certainly has a lot to offer in terms of comfort and capability, and it has for a long time. I think it's one of the best U options around, <clears throat> you know, absolutely. Uh, in, in terms of being a, a work and play vehicle, <clears throat> but also nice to drive, you know, yep. nice to throw the kids in, you know, around town. In the tray. Yeah. In the tray, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Underberg like style. Underberg style. Right. Well, you strap uh, them down. I know that. Of but... course. Of course. Yeah. Always safety, mate. Always safety. Oh, um, uh, and I think it just needs to continue on. I think there may be a few people that are getting a little bit uh, annoyed with the Toyota brand in general with the perception that they're doing the bare minimum sort of All right. with upgrades and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but certainly, you know, that is the brand to beat. Uh, and again, perception with return uh, in terms of reliability and dependability and, you know, long-term uh, and resale value. I mean, geez, Toyota tax, yes. <laughs> there's your retirement sorted <laughs> out when you, uh, when you, <laughs> when you sell yes. something. But um, uh, I like the look of the new thing. Uh, I'm always a bit sus, um, and like we had a quick chat before, I'm always a bit sus about sort of controlled, engineered content being fed to the yes. masses ra rather than genuine spy shots being sort of taken Captured. on the fly. And, yeah, yes. Um, because, you know, obviously they, they can control what you see. Um, you know, they can control the narrative, for want of a better word, um, yeah. uh, in, you know, in terms of, of how people see the vehicle in question yeah um, I, I like the current 3.2 and the current uh, two liter I, I like their thinking with these new engines um, especially in terms of you know more more talk and more low down talk yeah um, that'll give people uh, a bit more of an option uh, you know with engine so to, choice to that point um, what we're talking about uh, potentially is that the four cylinder twin turbo carries over to this next model as well as a single turbo version of, of that engine. But the, yeah. the theory is there'll be two V6s, a three-litre yeah. single, single turbo diesel 
185 kilowatts, 600 newton meters, yeah. um, and a 2.7 liter twin turbo petrol, 230 kilowatts, 540 newton meters. And there's even a plug-in hybrid um, that's been spotted uh, testing in Europe, which will, will come down the line, which would mix things up even more. And it's the it's the three liter turbo diesel that might find its way into a into a Ranger Raptor as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, six hundred newton meters. That's for the for the single turbo, the three liter. And um, I mean, that's you know, that's that's nothing to to shrug off. That's um, that's really decent. So, and a hundred more than in the current two liter. We've we've towed with the three point two, the current three point two, and the two liter. Uh, vans of different sizes camper trailers people always there's always sort of a a, a a sort of informal whining on forums and stuff about their long-term towing capabilities i can't speak with authority about that because obviously our tests take place over a couple of weeks and that sort of thing hmm. um, but but we've never had a problem <coughs> in in terms of drivability and, and safety and comfort um, yeah. and that's and that's hauling you know you know decent caravans two and a half ton um, and, and, a yeah. decent load on board, so. and, and Steve, um, you know, Ford has been there or thereabouts, but they're very much positioned as the Ranger and Mustang car company at the moment. Um, maybe they've got some moves going on in the background, but this is a critical car for them. Um, what, what do you think it has to do to, to, to get out in front? My problem is it's always been, it looks like this sort of thing, this this vehicle, it's got a big, powerful engine, but it's like having a sock down your pants and someone comes and goes, what's that? Oh, it's got a little uh, little four-cylinder. That, that's got a four-cylinder? Are you kidding me? Yeah. I'm just like, so I think the new engines are absolutely vital. But I think the question for me is, can you drag a Hilux buyer out because the Ranger is better or are they just Hilux buyers and they're Ranger buyers? Is this yes. the new Commodore versus Falcon? Yes, could be. one or the other. And it's yep. you see people on forums, they're so passionate about it. Yeah. I think the big advantage of the Ranger is the styling. It just looks so cool. Like, yeah. I want one, even though I don't want one. Yeah, true. Yeah. It's we'll like be, Land Cruisers and Patrols. Sorry, JC. It's like Land no Cruisers and Patrols. You can't convince anyone of, you know, that the other's actually a viable option to what they're, they're currently in or what they've been in for 20 years or whatever. Yes. You, just, you well, just can't. But I reckon a lot of people who are looking at, you know, at a, at a ute of that size and are torn between, oh, do I go the Hilux because everyone says it's reliable or do I worry about, you know, comfort and, you know, do I err on the side of comfort? Uh, I, yeah. I think there are a fair few people that, that, uh, that sit on the fence and I reckon the Ranger will tease a few over, um, mm. you know. I just wonder where yes. they say their conquest buyer is coming from. I don't think your Ranger's conquest buyer is a Hilux buyer. As you say, it's probably someone who's coming out of other cars and wants a Ute yeah. for the first time. You yes. know, they get, they're old enough now to buy, you know, they've had a, a smaller car and they're like, this fine, fine, I'm going to buy the Ute always wanted. Yes. But once you're in, I think you're going to buy another Ranger. You're, you're going in. to buy another Toyota. Yes. Yes, there's a lot of that. It's true. And, I mean, um, you mentioned uh, we were talking about how it might look. And you can see, and full transparency, as, as Crafty mentioned, Ford has sent us these images of a camouflage car, which is the inverse of the way things used to be, mm. <laughs> that um, yeah. you did your best to get a spy photographer out there hiding in the bushes um, and, and photographing these cars. So, you know, uh, but it, it is clear that it's going to take its design cues from the F-150 um, out of the States. And it's got that, that C or if it's the other side, D-shaped, you know, daytime running light. It, yeah. it's going to it's going to look tough um in the front yeah. um and there's been it's, it's locally engineered it's it's locally designed um moray callum who is the head of design at ford until earlier this year has just retired so he was overseeing the introduction of that that very tough look with those signature leds and much and all as australia would have been holding the um the pen as it were or the the mouse um, he would have been overseeing the way it looks and how it fits into the Ford uh, family overall. So, and that's no bad thing. I think that F one fifty does the job in terms of looking macho and and all those things that it has to do. Isn't it weird when you go back in time? I remember like I'm old enough now going to America and driving an F one fifty around for a few weeks, and, just, and when it was the world's biggest selling car, and coming back to Australia and going, "Wow, thank goodness we don't like all that American trash." <laughs> like we don't, we don't, we even, we drive Utes that look like little yeah. two door sporty things. We don't drive pickup trucks. Yeah. Now all that's happened is we drive pickup trucks, 
but we call them utes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, but apparently that styling is like, well, our, our love of things that are American and look American has yeah. just got, you know, greater and greater. That there's, there's, yeah. It's not, it's certainly not, you know, my Australian engineer is not Australian looking. It's just no. that we want an American truck and the more of an American truck it looks, the more we want it. Well, yeah. witness the success of Ram, you know, they've yeah. um, taken the full size thing and, uh, and I was looking at the numbers for, not that I can quote them off, off the cuff, but um uh, the Silverado um, is starting to pick up ahead of steam as well. So there's mm. an appetite for sure. Yeah. Someone yeah. asked me about that. They, they said, where, where do people park these things in America? Because they've never been there. And I said, oh, well, the whole place is a car park. Mm. It's, it's right. a giant car park with huge spaces. But mm. they look, true. you drive those rams here, it's just it just feels like there's your feet are too big for your shoes. It's, yeah. like- <laughs> it's interesting, actually, in some, you know, I'm, I'm in Sydney and, and you look at some of the well-established suburbs, um, and the, the garages for the houses that have survived are so small mm. uh, because uh, cars this time, well, not this time, but a little bit later, last century were tiny. Mm. Um, and in America, yeah, the car rules. It's all built to a, a, an automotive scale, not a human scale. Mm. I've just moved house and my carport won't fit half of the cars I bring home. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. I'm living the dream. <laughs> but in, in line with that F-150, the, some of the things we do know is that it's going to pick up, uh, the, the range is going to pick up the latest um, Sync 4 uh, multimedia mm. system from Ford. Yeah. So it's going to be right there in terms of multimedia, a big screen. And uh, the theory is it'll be a vertical screen mm. in the centre, digital instrumentation. Um, all of that. So it's it's really going to have some uh, cards up its sleeve when it comes to that kind of touch screen and uh, all of that bizo as well, which will be welcome, I'm sure. Mm, you can't underestimate how important that is to a certain demographic. Yeah. Like, and that's it. Maybe a Toyota's demographic is different to that, but, um, you know, people people have grown up with sucking, sucking a, a touch screen rather than their thumb. Mm. All right. All that stuff's very important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The other thing is that, I mean, it's important to note that this will be a shared model with Volkswagen and, and this will essentially be the next Amarok. Um, and so much of the development work has been carried out from Ford's point of view in Australia. Mm-hmm. That bodes well for the Amarok as well. So uh, what do you make of that, Crafty? Does the Amarok need a little bit of local tuning to make it a better vehicle? Oh, I mean, probably. You know, they all can and, and, and that's been just part of the process for you know, a long time is testing here, like real world testing rather than making some sort of, you know, arbitrary sort of gesture towards doing it. They they take it seriously and they put plenty of hours in because the first thing is, you know, if, uh, yeah, well, especially rural buyers, they'll get on corrugations and corrugation yeah. punish, punish yes. any vehicle. So, okay. you know, uh, they put it all... Uh, through all of that and also dust sealing and water sealing, you know, going through water and that sort of thing, because you get any of these electronics dusty or dirty or wet and you're in a big barrel of straw. It's, 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 you know, case in point being the Toyota crown behind you, which is, that's a very Mm -hmm. rare photograph of you undergoing hot weather testing um, in period, but actually that's rubbish. Tell us what, tell us what it actually is, Crafty. No, that's that. Yeah, that is actually a Toyota Crown undertaking testing. And where in the chopper, JC? That was back in the seventies. <laughs> I think I was twelve, and you were you were nine. Yeah, and no now way. we're actually part of. <laughs> and you're allowed to photograph. You're allowed no, to photograph was... the rock more remarkably because you can't get those yeah, photos that's, now. Yeah. That's that's correct. Mm. Um, uh, no, that's actually a still from a movie called The Man from Hong Kong, Hong Kong. which was a yeah. which was an action film in the seventies, uh, directed by an Aussie stuntman, um, and that. That crown ends up rolling in a couple of seconds and bursting into flames. That is criminal. Uh, that is because criminal. it hit a German backpacker. No, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it was a Goanna or something. So, cool. but, um, yeah, and it was so, we were saying off air. It was George Lazenby who was the one-time James Bond played a baddie. Played the played the main villain. The villain. Yeah. yeah. All right. And I sort of vaguely remember the movie as being a bunch of hang gliding and cra- car crashes and that sort of thing. But uh, good. Remember. So it had all the appropriate ingredients yeah, for a high quality. Yeah, for sure. And uh, those were the seventies. So obviously, it was lucky that no one died. They probably did. They just didn't tell anyone. Yeah, that's right. Just didn't tell <laughs> any people died. Yeah, that's right. You know those real stunts, the movies with the real yeah. cars. Right. Actual danger, man. That's right. Yeah. 
All right. Well, um, so what we're looking at in terms of a timetable is the uh, the global reveal of this ranger is going to be before the end of the year, and we're closing in on that pretty rapidly. So it's a matter of weeks, probably not not months, I would argue. And um, it's going to hit dealers' uh, chesto in another piece we're theorising in the first quarter of next year. It's been delayed a little bit by uh, all of the problems that the automotive industry is having globally about uh, semiconductor shortages for microchips and mm-hmm. uh, COVID constraints in terms of distribution, but uh, that's what we're banking on is Q1 2022. People will be able to go in and put their money down and um, update to this this new arranger. So very interesting. And it would be great to get feedback from people that are watching or listening uh, in terms of are you a current ranger owner? Are you a prospective ranger owner? What about Hilux? Um, Just to get your thoughts on what this vehicle needs to do um, to get ahead of the pack. So uh, that, that would be good. Now, Happily, we're going to return to our garage in terms of the fresh metal that we've been driving. Um, Things in various parts of Australia are loosening up somewhat in terms of access to vehicles and movement outside of your house. And we've got back into getting vehicles for uh, assessment in a pretty big way. And Crafty, please kick us off with the vehicle that you have been driving in the past week or so. I've been um, I've been in an Isuzu MUX, which is the seven seater Ute based wagon. So it's based on the D Max, which is very popular. Um, I had fun. It's um, it's very capable uh, off road uh, and quite comfortable. They've done a lot in terms of safety tech or driver assist tech. So they brought that um, up to date because I think. Um, Oh, it's been it's been ten years or so since it, you know, had any substantial upgrade. And this is right. supposedly uh, all new stuff. Well, it's 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 all based on the new D Max uh, platform. Uh, yeah, I had it for about a week, um, and we took it on some serious uh, four wheel driving tracks. Uh, do do uh, you have crafty like a regular? four-wheel drive track that you use for kind of a, as a yardstick, as it were, or, or you you mix it up a bit? And is it within lo- five k's of my house? It's the local supermarket car park. Yes, right. exactly. <laughs> yes. So you're you're yeah. using Real Kia, Pican- Kia yeah. Picantos as, yeah. um, you know, rocks to rumble up. <laughs> Real-world testing, mate, just up onto the gutter. Just get a wheel up onto the gutter. No, we've got, uh, yeah, we've got a couple of locations um, that are our sort of... Uh, unofficial testing and proving grounds. We've got a few set piece uh, rocky climbs uh, that we that I usually uh, put things on just to see how they go. Mm. Um, with uh, And you know I'm a big fan of tyre pressures, so, so I put them up the climbs, uh, if it's safe, um, on road pressures because people will be lazy and yeah. think they can tackle anything, so they'll go straight on to some. That, that, that's actually your superhero alter ego is Mr. Tire Pressure. That's you right. just, you just right. fly in and that's adjust right. people's tire yeah. pressures to that's save their lives. That's right. And his theme song that's is Take the Pressure you. Down by John Farnham. <laughs> Take that's the Pressure right. Down. That's right. That's right. How do you guys know all this? You oh, must amazing. subscribe to my blog. Yeah. I saw you in the you phone know. box changing. You get the sense when he talks about these places, James, that he, he'd like to tell you where they are, but he'd have to kill you. I know, that's <laughs> right. Yes, I don't even venture um, into that territory. <laughs> <laughs> so what we what we do um, is, is, is try the climbs uh, on road pressures because, again, people are lazy, and then try it, you know, adjust the pressures. And, oh, um, good. Yeah, and, great. And, yep. and usually, unless uh, the weather's been pretty horrendous and it's really washed out, um, the, the vehicle... Um, you know, if well, if it's a four-wheel drive and if it's got diff locks and, and it's got a decent off-road traction control system, it will usually manage. Uh, sometimes not so comfortably, but it will usually manage. And and the MUX, to its credit, uh, uh, did. Uh, we had a run on road pressures and and you know obviously didn't. Um, yep. Because yep. it, it was a bit washed out at the time. The, the so so the steps are sharper. The rock steps yes. are sharper. And yes. Yes. But yeah, I enjoyed it, and uh, again, credit to Azuzu for for bringing it sort of into the twenty first century. Good, for, yeah, with, good with safety gear, and that's yep. a, and that's a big plus. But I have to mention um, the price. I've I've always been willing to forgive it for sounding like a truck and driving a bit like a truck and that sort of because it was always a reasonable uh, uh, option in terms of price. 
the pricing as standard for this one, and this was a mid spec, was fifty nine nine hundred. Um, right, I think. Yeah. And that was before on roads. Our yeah. test vehicle was tickling sixty eight because it wow. had a tow bar, tow yeah. bar kit, uh, an electric brake control, and a few other bits and pieces which I can't remember right now. Oh, the paint, the silver paint, I think it was five hundred off the top of my head. Right, but that's yeah. that's a lot of money for for you know something that doesn't have electric seats. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't have ventilated seats or, or heat, mm. or, you know, or, or any of those sort of things you, you might expect to get in something that was substantially cheaper, maybe a little bit more city friendly than this or suited to a city than yep. this. Yep. But, you know, it's a lot of money to, to get a sort of, uh, you know, it's almost an entry level vehicle. Again, I enjoy driving it. It's very capable. I think our Zuzu faithful will, will be happy with it. Um, yeah. So I'd, I'd like to think that, pricing will will change but that's a bit of a you know I, I suppose it's a it's a case of those body on frame suvs and and of course the utes that are, they're derived from um we were talking last week about the 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 new uh chinese invasion as it were in terms of uh utes and suvs that will potentially undercut them substantially on on price it'll be interesting to watch that dynamic as as whether or not people's loyalty will be tempted tested and tempted away yeah, well, that's right. Well, just just on a side note, uh, I'm a big fan of the of the Triton, um, in you know for pricing and, and capability and yep. and you know comfort. Um, but uh, I think again in this latest VFAX, uh, GWM has overtaken. Yeah. So it's it's happening, and I mean yeah. people and and for better or worse, I mean down the line maybe they're you know they they you know they're really unhappy with what they've bought, but. Yeah, sales. I mean, at the the change is happening. Whereas Triton used to be a real budget choice, people are opting. The here market's and there for been a, repositioned. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that's that's beautiful. Thank you, Crafty. Um, and Steve, you've had a, a kind of life change in terms of location and transportation. What what is going on? I have. I've had a uh, an electric. Wall box car charger thing installed in my garage. It's very exciting. I can't, I'm, I'm alert. I'm disappointed at how excited I was about it. I was one of these guys <laughs> hopping around the trades and going, "This is awesome! It's like having a petrol station in your house." Yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got a little Krispy Kreme stand. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Servo pies. Fridge. Have you got fridge. servo pies and sausage rolls? I'm very keen for the pies. I can probably getting a pie warmer out there. Fantastic. <laughs> the thing is, you don't go there very often. That's the problem. So I got the charger, and I've also got a long term. Uh, Hyundai Kona EV, mm-hmm. and I'm desperate to charge it again. That's a problem. So it's it's got too much range. Too much liking. range. I don't like. <laughs> I don't like the waiting. But no. So I got it. I got it, and it would had. I took it down to eighty percent charge. It took an hour and forty minutes to charge it back to hundred percent. Now it's supposed yeah. to get about four eighty something, and okay. my my rate my charger is so good. I really topped it up. Like you know, we put that a little bit extra bit of petrol at the top. I got four four hundred and ninety four kilometers as the proposed range, and I seem to be likely to get it. But at the moment, that's uh, a lot of ten kilometer round trip journeys. Okay, <laughs> that's about all yeah. we can do. So yeah. That's 50, 50 journeys to run the battery down, mm. and I'm trying to run it all the way down so I can charge it again. So I had a Mitsubishi Fev the other day and plugged that in. That, that took three hours for that small battery to recharge, and I sort of sat out there watching the lights blinking and so on. So it's very the, ch- the charge is almost did, did, more exciting than the car. Did that mean um, you're talking about the tradies? Did they have to install three phase power for you to get a no? I've got single phase, single phase power, and they were able to connect the box, no problem. All right, amazing. All right, and so you've got the the you said it's Kona long term Kona EV. You've got that car now, and how has it been on these ten kilometer round trips? (laughs) Well, I, I've driven it roughly half as often as my wife, who loves it dearly and would probably ah. buy it. Um, I really like driving it. I, I don't like the normal Kona at all, and yet I really like yep. driving this because it just gives it grunt. You know, and I'm, I'm so distracted by the grunt and the driving that I'm less annoyed about the the slightly cheap the the plastics and that awful <laughs> that awful system where you change gears with buttons rather than you know a, a stick. Yes. I can't stand yes. that. That drives me bonkers. But every if I you have to not think about the price because I've got heated mm. seats, heated steering wheel. I've got the, the top spec one, but it's sixty six grand, mm. and it's a good looking thing. I love the style of it and so on. And um, the boot's a bit small. It's kind of one. It's not you know practical for uh, for a family of growing children like mine. Mm. It's not super practical, but I'd I'd love driving it. And I, I could absolutely see why how it could be your second car. 
Yes, for, for city journeys, all that kind of thing. And I'm getting solar next week. So it's the first time my very carbon heavy uh, job. I'll, yep. I'll, I'll yes. find doing my bit. I'll be able to charge a car. You'll, you'll be able to offset sun, that to a certain I'll be able to offset some of the evil I've done with Ferrari and Lamborghini <laughs> over the years, but not much. What about, what about all those, uh, you know, international flights? The, well, the flights, <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to point you to the last 18 months, and uh, I've been very good on that basis. Where, yes. where have you moved to, mate? Have you moved to Byron Bay just to be closer to the Hemworth? Hemsworth, I've, I've, moved to, I've moved to some suburb that people have never heard of. I oh, okay, them, cool. Uh, oh, no, don't tell us, but. No, yeah. it's just like it's sounds not, like you've got an old hippie. Well, I used to live very close to the uh, to the city, and now yeah. I don't. So oh, <laughs> you need good on you. There's a lot more driving involved. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Fun. Well, that's amazing. What a what a transformation! Exactly. You know, you've yeah. got your power wall. You've got the. Wow. Uh, solar. I don't have a power wall now. So that's the big debate: is whether I get a power wall. And this is All the right. thing about and the solar is coming next week. But the, even they said, "Don't buy a power wall. It takes so many years to get the money back." But right. if they, the, the rumor now is they're going to start stitching everyone up on the, um, there's so much solar now that they're going to start charging you to have solar and put it back into the grid rather than yes. give you money yeah. putting it back into the grid. So yeah, I probably got on it just at the wrong time. I, I probably <laughs> basically bought Tesla shares just after they peaked. It's interesting. We had some feedback on that, which we'll get to, we will get to shortly. But I suppose the, the point you make about the price of the car, uh, I know you authored a story recently about why our electric cars you know, so much more expensive than their internal combustion equivalents. And I suppose a simplistic take on it might be that these technologies will inevitably come down in price as the, you know, costs scale improves Mm -hmm. um, and the technology becomes simpler and and Mm -hmm. cheaper to apply. It's just one of those things, isn't it? It's Mm -hmm. a, it's a leading edge technology that, that needs to bed in and be developed. Sorry, mate, you go. I also interviewed uh, Bill Shorten last week about he's bought a Tesla. Yes. He's, he's got a Tesla as his company car through the Commonwealth. He's the only politician to have an EV. And okay. he, but he doesn't buy the idea that you need to subsidise. I said it would make sense if you gave me 10 grand to buy one, which mm. is kind of what they do in America. They give you 10 grand, give me free red Joe, let me drive in the bus lane, all these things. Mm. And yeah. he said what he, what's blowing him away is just how much money he's actually saving on petrol. And he said, right. I think if you, once you've got one and you realise how much money it's saving you, he said that should be enough of an incentive. But he said, I understand that at 60 grand, it's still a middle class mm. kind, of, kind of level of car. He said, but it's about what people are paying for all the SUVs that my colleagues drive. So totally. So we got 60 grand for that. We can get 60 grand for this. And he loves the Tesla. Absolutely loves it. Great. Good one. I mean, you will witness your, your feedback crafty on the MUX that um, there you are. You're spending, what would what, what you say was the upper end for the MUX? Uh, I know that one's 68, but that's got the tow bar and everything. But it's 60 as standard, but that's yeah. without uh, ventilated seats or, elect- or, you know, electrically adjustable seats. Yeah. Those sort yeah. of things that you just assume would be in something. And there's yeah. often in things that are, you know, that are much cheaper. Mm-hmm. So. Yep. All right. Well, that's good, Steve. It'll be great to catch up with how that all goes during your long-term. Yeah, uh, I look forward to driving uh, it further. Custodianship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Green um, Steve, yeah. Green Steve, I'm impressed. Green Steve, yeah, no, that's Green. good. Yeah, uh, who would have thought? <laughs> Thunk it. Um, now I can I can round things out with the Hyundai Staria. Um, now this, of course, is the replacement for the IMAX and iLoad. There's a Staria Load, the the uh, awkwardly named, I would argue, Staria Load. Yeah. Um, but so this good. version, that was, that was, a Korean, is, a Korean um, movie. You wouldn't watch it with your kids. <laughs> That was, that was Corby's nickname in the 20s. In his it's true. It's true. He's actually got a tattoo to that effect um, somewhere on his person. Um, yep. It's an eight-seat uh, people mover. So this one's replacing the IMAX. And the one I was in was the Highlander diesel. So Highlander is wow. the higher spec. And diesel means 2.2-litre turbo diesel, four-cylinder. And this one's a all-wheel drive, so on-demand all-wheel drive. I think default is front-wheel drive, and then you'll get some rear drive if it's required. Um, and an eight-speed auto. And the, the key takeout for this car is that it is immense. Um, it's 5.2 metres long. It's two metres high and two metres wide. So it's like this slope-nosed bread box. Mm. You know, it's just this tube, uh, squared-off tube uh, of metal that is large, um, 130 kilowatts um, and 430 newton metres, which is, which is pretty handsome, 1,500 to 2,500 RPM is where that torque is, claiming 8.2 litres per 100 Ks. Um, it's $66,500 plus on roads. 
So you're, you're in the same ballpark as a Kia Carnival Platinum mm. and a mid to top spec Volkswagen multivan with the four motion, you know, the, the, the all wheel drive. The entry point for these cars is under 50. You know, a petrol V6 front wheel drives under 50. But this one was getting up into the higher 60, 66 and a half grand. But with size comes just this amazing accommodation. Mm. Um, even with all of the r- three rows of seats up, you've got 832 litres of boot space, which is what most SUVs have when you've folded the seats down. This thing, you can have eight people in it and 832 litres of, of luggage space. Put that third row down and it's 1,303. It's like a, an indoor tennis court, you know, by, mm. by the time you do that. And at that money... Um, it's loaded. I could bore you to tears with all of the stuff that's in it, but just to cherry pick a few, you know, it's the auto doors and tailgate. Um, You've got various drive modes. There are cameras everywhere, digital display, digital instruments. It's leather appointed, the climate control, big roof panels, all that stuff. So it's got all that. And, And on the plus side, I'd say it's huge. So if you've got to ferry people around in reasonable numbers, it's going to accommodate them easily. There's just hectares of room. Uh, it gets along okay. There's loads of safety tech, passive and active safety tech uh, in there as well. Power outlets and storage everywhere. So if you've got kids that need to power up devices, there aren't going to be any arguments. There's no problem. Um, multi-zone climate with vents everywhere as well. And I really like, just on a small point, the fact it's got a full-size alloy spare. <laughs> I really like that. It's quite rare, oh, but there it, it is. It is good, yeah. And on the minus side, it's huge. Um, it's, it's just difficult to kind of negotiate things in it. The ride is a little bit firm. It's, it's not in the carnivals class in terms of its refinement. It's got strut front multi-link rear, but it's a bit noisy as well. Just a little bit, I wouldn't say harsh, but just a bit bumpy. And, and along with all of this equipment goes kind of knock on hard plastics, you know, around the, the dash and whatever you, which is a bit of a surprise. The audio is six speaker for such an enormous car and for a reasonable cost of entry. I would have thought that would be a bit better. And I'm just not in love with the look of it. That's a totally subjective thing. It's got that very space age kind of slope nose with the um, DRL, LED DRLs. Say, along, along James, you bury the lead. I love the look of that thing. You I do? I think it looks amazing. I, I okay. They've, they've achieved the impossible. They've made a van. Look, look good. good. Okay, that's good. One. I had to borrow one the other day off our colleague Gottlieb because I had to move a giant bookcase. So I put all yeah. the seats down and trust me, you could, you could fit a library in there. You could put the National <laughs> Library in the back of the thing. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But it, so good. I ended up in hospital, but uh, that's a long, that's another story. But <laughs> you walk you walk up, you walk towards this thing and you go, and I, I had my daughter with me who's 10 and she's like, oh, my, look at it. Wow, it's amazing. I said, no, I'm, you know, you feel like you're about to drive the future. And then you get in, you turn on the diesel and you feel the hard plastics. You go, no. <laughs> well, not for the first time, I may not be in the majority, uh, but that's just, and the car that I was driving was black, which tends to give it this sort of amorphous blobby look. Um, mm. So maybe that had something to do with it, but it also has the biggest tail lights in the history of tail lights. I remember, mm. I think it was the Pajero Sport where it had these yeah. tail lights where it oh, looked like yeah. they yeah. melted down the back of yeah. the car. Yeah. These, these are enormous. They go from more or less the roof Wow. And with a little break where the tailgate is, right down at the bottom of the car. That's uh, something that stands out. But anyway, there it is. Uh, all right. So now on to some feedback from last week's episode, which was evocatively titled Chinese Youth Gone Wild, uh, which was uh, Chesto's virtual walk around the Chengdu Motor Show to look what was coming uh, out of it Ute-wise. And first of all, before we even got into that, John Howitt made the uh, very sharp observation that we were sharing Zoom logins. And yes, you've got us, uh, JH. Last week, Tom was labelled as crafty. So oh, really? uh, it was great there that you, you could join us last week, yeah, uh, Marcus. Yeah, thanks. No, yeah, no, no, no. entertaining. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and Justin was Steve Otley, uh, which is very, very oh, difficult wow. to, oh, to oh, adjust. Yeah. So yeah. I think we'll beat uh, Brett Sullivan with a wet lettuce over that mm. one. Um, <laughs> and thank you very much for pointing it out. But Who am I this week? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good, good point. Newton. <laughs> um, Steve Simons, Simon Simons, I'm not sure. Apologies, Steve. Um, put them in a coal mine for a few years. See if they're still going with 150,000 kilometres on them with bugger all problems. Hilux has the runs on the board. Yeah. So there you go, Crafty. You were talking mm. about the Toyota tax. But 
it, it certainly has that reputation in terms of uh, longevity and, and durability. All right. Um, now, Rabbids Minions says, what is the hype of all these Chinese-made vehicles? I wouldn't touch one with a 10-foot pole. And that put me in mind, on, on social media, I do subscribe to uh, Viz Comic, uh, Viz Comics, oh. and they occasionally run some readers' letters. And <laughs> this one, Will, said, this was his advice, carry a 10-foot pole around with you everywhere you go in case you come across something you wouldn't touch with it. <laughs> then you can say, I wouldn't touch that with this while pointing to it. So saving you having to say a 10-foot pole oh. all the time. <laughs> Or a barge pole, if you can't find a 10-foot pole. Exactly, a 10-foot pole or a barge pole. Plenty of those so, around London, yeah. Brilliant yeah. advice. Um, but then Barefoot Piglet, who I think was coming to us from China, said, keep your words for next 20 years. Wow. So uh, I think Barefoot uh, believes that some of the uh, Chinese brands are playing the long game and that mm. they'll be around for some time. I think that's the social media tag of the Chinese government. Is it? <laughs> Very good. Now, um, Greg Burville. He says, I think he's saying what a lot of us might secretly think here. There's no wow factor. When you pull up in your Chinese Raptor substitute, you'd spend the rest of the day justifying it to your mates. By the way, love the show. And I think but you just keep saying it was cheap. It was cheap. Yeah, that's, was right, cheap. that's right. Yeah. But it's not going to save you. Sound I, like I, a chicken. I, <laughs> so I think Greg speaks for some of us on that. Um, then... Crafty, this is interesting. Um, this person comes to us from uh, South Africa. So I'm going to have a crack at his name. Uh, Nkosanathi Nkosi. Um, mm. Chinese, oh, oh, you did pretty how well do I there. go? Mm. Um, Chinese Nkosi. products are worth a try on the basis of value for money, the point you just made, Steve, very cheap. Um, as a South African, I can't wait for a cheaper version of the Ranger Raptor. And the Ute thing or the Baki is, is enormous in South Baki. Africa as well, yeah? Mm. Bucky, uh, yeah. When you were there, were you driving a Bucky? Uh, uh, no, I wasn't actually. I, I foolishly bought a Land Rover Discovery um, and used oh. that. What? that. But that served me. That served me. <laughs> oh, no, this was this was a 1996 Discovery, so the old V8 petrol. Was uh, were you trying to write an amusing novel about? <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you do? That? <laughs> um, well, ev everyone's got to own a Land Rover once in their life, mate. Once, so. Gotcha. Uh, I've got a lot of mates who've owned several of them and, and uh, you know, are all the better for it. My, I my say better, disco. I mean worse. Let's go to a disco. Right. My, um, my brother had a Series 1 uh, Landy for a while and he had a drum of paint in the back of it which fell over at the bottom of the street we lived on. So he forever branded Boyle Street Balgala with a white stripe down the centre <laughs> um, about half a metre wide. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was his contribution. Um, now, Patrick Fogarty says, will they rust? And that put me in mind of <laughs> sitting behind in traffic, you know, an earlier Great Wall, I want to say it's 2010 or something mm, like that. It's a, mm. it's a decade ago. And there was rust bubbling around the, oh, yeah. the tailgate. Yeah. And also now, missing a few letters on the, on the branding. You know, maybe. Were... And I, it just put me in mind of the fact that you're just not conscious of rust in modern cars anymore. It, it's not an issue. And later models have been around long enough that, that they haven't, given in to the, the tin worm or whatever, but it was very interesting. I was sitting behind that car, going, God, it's rusty. Mm. And it may have been a fishmonger or something who was, you know, constantly filling the back with salt water, but um, it was very odd to, <laughs> very very odd to see. That's a very generous theory, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> now, but to, to, to wrap that part of the feedback off, Alex Lack's review says, as a Chinese, I don't believe this trash. So, so he's, just, <laughs> like he's just speaking on behalf of, wow. of an entire uh, yeah. group of people. Yeah. I wonder if you're in China and you Google uh, uh, Chinese cars crap or something, but probably this doesn't come up. It's like Tiananmen <laughs> Square. That's <laughs> <Yeah>, true. <laughs> it's now, blocked. What, what last week's uh, program also touched on was a discussion around alternate energy sources uh, for personal transportation. And regular correspondent Bill Katapoda said he's excited by an electric vehicle's potential to push power back out for house power during blackouts, for example. And he's worked out that for the cost of an MG ZS EV, very close to a conversation you and I were having uh, yesterday, Steve, it's basically the cost of an MG ZST plus a Tesla Powerwall 2. Um, if you buy two EVs and they're charged, at a, charged up at home with solar system, 
You could almost go off grid during lockdowns or blackouts with solar powering the home during the day and your cars powering it during the night. What an exciting future we have to look forward to. And um, de Kook, our old mate, had done some um, calculations and he reckons the Ionic 5 could supply his household energy needs for five days in winter. And, and Bill's very keen on an Ionic 5 as well. Is that, is that your future in, in a nutshell there, Steve? Well, don't, don't start me with the nerding out. So V2G is amazing, but the Australian government's still got to approve it. But Leaf can do it. Eclipse Cross can do it. You just need to, I would need to change my wall box and then I could uh, charge the car up during the day with solar and it would yep. definitely get me two to three days of running the whole house. Wow. So, well, that's the point that de Kook makes. At the moment, um, the only he, he uh, plug and play setup, uh, pun intended, mm. is the Nissan Leaf. And he two energy suppliers, Rectifier and Jet Energy, um, it's about four and a half K for the box. Um, so he's done the sums and he's very keen. Well, they're running a trial in Canberra. I think there are 30 Nissan Leafs running around using V2G. So it's being trialled as we speak with the Leaf, the new Leaf. Yeah. And um, we uh, we interviewed the professor down there at ANU. He's like all for it. And when you look at that, you go, why would I buy a Powerwall or any kind of battery when eventually I'd my car, which my car should be able to do we'll, that. We'll do that. Yeah. Yes. yes. You've got a giant battery parked in the driveway. So why not use it? And it's plugged into your house anyway. All it needs to do is to send the energy the other way. That's 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 cool. And Remus, King of Rome, five, uh, we were talking about hydrogen. He says, apparently oil and gas companies, when drilling exploration wells, can sometimes find hydrogen layers, just hydrogen. Um, if true, you can imagine a lot of old well data being re-examined to see if there are any layers of blue gold. Uh, to be found, <laughs> maybe another energy boom. So um, it's a bit like when a coal mine becomes economic. If the price goes to a certain level, I think people are scratching their head and saying, well, maybe we should reopen that coal mine because we can actually make money out of it. Mm. But this time around, it's with hydrogen. That's a sign of the times. Mm. Um, now, where are we? Next person to get in touch, Marco Vess. Marco Vess, he's lived with a battery EV for a few months. I think he's, uh, from memory, it's a Tesla. Uh, Model 3, but he might correct us if I'm wrong on that. And the idea of paying to stand around refueling at some quote-unquote quote, janky servo uh, <laughs> with hydrogen has zero appeal compared to charging at home. At his convenience, usually for free on solar power. We have to get over this idea that Australia is some sort of special case for cars. 86% of us, I haven't fact-checked that data, live in urban areas. <laughs> The way people carry on, you'd think we all regularly towed caravans to Perth, I presume Marco doesn't live in Fremantle, um, without stopping and live nowhere near a PowerPoint. So it's a, it's a fair point. And TGV, the trainer Grand Vitesse, um, said, quoted him back, saying, usually for free on solar power. It's not free. You had to purchase the solar panels and pay for them to be installed. Same as emissions free, emissions were used to make it. So it's a direct or indirect equation. That's the difference between, you know, zero tailpipe emissions and zero emissions overall is what are the emissions at source of the energy and all of that stuff. And that's still an important conversation. I think with the range is like, what will be enough range that people go? So they work on a thousand kilometer EV battery in China as well, and it must be massive. But once we get to a thousand kilometer battery, does that solve the problem or is it still the speed of the charging? And people say, I don't want an EV because I can't drive to Brisbane from Sydney. When was the last time you drove to Brisbane? Oh, never. Yes. I'm just yes. a jet star flight, but I want to be able to drive, you know? So yes. certainly it's your second car. I mean, that's, that's how it started in Norway. When I, I remember going there and saying, everyone's got an EV, but how do they do long journeys? Oh, that's all got, they've also got a petrol car. So the EV becomes well, we, we, most of the time and your petrol car becomes a secondary car. Well, we had other correspondence uh, related to Tom made mention of a Merck F-cell car, which is actually a hydrogen hybrid. So you've got mm. an electric motor, plug in, charge, charge the battery to run the motor uh, for short city journeys. And then you've got a hydrogen tank to run it on longer journeys. So uh, that maybe has potential as well. Well, it's a longer discussion, but I've just had that Mitsubishi Fev and I ran it for a week without engaging the engine. Yes. So yes. Yeah, I didn't use engine, but if I wanted to drive a thousand kilometers, I certainly could. Yeah. And where does it sit with you, Crafty, in terms of um, you know alternate propulsion and and off off road, off highway, remote distance kind of stuff? Well, I was just um, I was waiting to interject with Stephen there because uh, hmm. he wasn't talking for me when he said when was the last time anyone drove to Brisbane. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I don't talk to you ever. <laughs> well, I'd expect you to lower your voice if you weren't. <laughs> um, 
uh, I mean, obviously, uh, in the, in the current uh, global climate we're in, I haven't driven to Brisbane for a long time, but my family live uh, even further up in Queensland, believe it or not. Yep. Uh, and and I have uh, many times uh, driven all the way uh, because we have we have mangy dogs. So I drive, and the family flies. I uh, see. Oh um, wow. Um, Do they fly with the dogs? That's, the <laughs> no, the family. that's right. No, no, the dogs come with me. Okay. Um, but I, I, for one, like people always assume that four-wheel drivers, um, you know, traditionalists and they don't want any EVs or whatever. I don't think that's the case. People are just really keen. You're talking about pricing and technology before. People are really keen to get in the things. Yeah. But the prices have got to come down. I mean. Right. I, I know a lot of people ready to, you know, and we're one, our, our family is one, we're ready to, you know, as soon as things are more affordable. Um, and range, you know, not not such a big deal. I mean, once the infrastructure is improved. And, yep. uh, I mean, if you go remote area touring, uh, you know, then obviously it is a, a, a problem. But people, you know, people chop out fuel to, to regions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. through which they're going to go. So there's no reason why, you know, you couldn't factor that in if you're in an EV or something. True. Well, I, I, for what it's worth, I reckon we're going to have a blended car park, you know, over the next decade or so that yeah. we've been used to everything is internal combustion and it's just this uniform means of, of powering vehicles around the world. It's not going to be that way. It's going to be, no. in my view, a lot more fractured so that for t- particular purposes, we'll have a particular powertrain to, to yeah. serve that need. Yeah. Mm. But there's no reason why there can't be overlaps. There's no reason yeah. why there can't be a, a decent, you know, off-road vehicle that is an EV. Uh, yeah. Also. And, I mean, so, Porsche is madly investing in e-fuels, uh, as is Formula One, by the way, so that they mm. can continue to have internal combustion engines racing around a circuit. Um, mm. So there are all kinds of motives behind the, the different... Uh, technologies that are emerging. I mean, Porsche just wants to keep all its 911s on the road because that's its brand. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, interesting. That's a worthy goal. It is so, a worthy goal. I I agree. So, well, so when, the, when you drive the Taycan and it's so amazing, you go, well, yeah. if we had to put up electric Porsches, at least they would. At least they're incredible. You know, yes. that, that kind of ridiculous speed and so on that no one else has really pulled off in an EV. Porsche do a good job of that. Though. I can't wait to drive the EV Boxster. It'll be yes. amazing. I mean, I mean, a Tesla Model S Plaid um, would be. Uh, <laughs> well, yes, yeah, so But I was reading, I was reading a, a, a long, online about someone who had an, an influencer who had bought or was driving a Model S Plaid at a racetrack, had fried the brakes and crashed it, and was <laughs> telling telling everybody everybody that wanted to listen what a great car it was, <laughs> um, because that's the thing with an EV because you've often got regen braking. The actual physical brakes aren't that huge, so when you start to punt it around a track, maybe you need a brake upgrade. But mm-hmm. uh, anyway, that was fun. I reckon. Um, with that, we have reached the finish line. So thank you for joining, Crafty. Uh, thank you. And and thank you, Steve. I'm esteemed. <laughs> you are indeed. <laughs> and thanks to our master of reverse psychology, bingo beast, and rocket recovery technician, Mr. Pritchard for going above and beyond the strict call of duty in getting this episode out into the world. Today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, people are so judgmental, I can tell just by looking at them. And sad face jeans and flood flip-flops. If people on YouTube will know what we mean, they're extraordinary. (laughs) Um, Jump into the conversation, Cars Guide is on Facebook and Instagram, or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Apple Podcast listeners, Please take a moment to rate and review the show. Five is the preferred number of stars. Thank you. Um, If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, I was uh, dropping the car off for service earlier this week and the bloke on the reception told me he just bought a top-of-the-line hearing aid for 7000 bucks. I said, really? What kind is it? He said, 930 (laughs) (laughs) 